Well, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, trust you've had a wonderful, restful afternoon and uh, a chance to reflect a little bit on some of the talks that you've already heard today. And our topic this afternoon is, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? We're going to take all of this information you've, you've received today and say, how can we actually experience it? Experience these realities that we've heard about. And it reminds me of a story. You see, as some of you may know, I'm originally from Scotland. And uh, it reminds me of a story of a, of a very famous zoo in Scotland, the Edinburgh Zoo. And uh, it, a number of years ago, it was very famed for uh, uh, the fact that it had a gorilla, a very famous gorilla. And unfortunately, one year, the gorilla died. Everyone say, ah. Oh. Oh. It, it was very, very sad, very, very tragic. But it just so happened that at the same time as this gorilla died, this, uh, this man from Glasgow was applying for a job. And the managers come up with this idea that what if we got one of those gorilla suits, and it would just be a few weeks. And we could put it on this man and uh, just have him hang out in the back of the gorilla cage for a couple of weeks until we got a replacement. So they interviewed this man from Glasgow, and they gave him the job. And uh, he reluctantly put on the suits, went into the cage, because he was really in need of a job. And uh, it wasn't the most exciting thing at first, but what he found was that the more he kind of got into it, uh, the more exciting it was, people actually began to gather and they'd throw him bananas and they'd even throw him money. Don't know what they thought a gorilla was going to do with money. but And uh, so as the days wore on, he, he began to get quite adept at swinging on the bars. And uh, he got more daring as time went on. And one particular day, he said, that's it. I'm, I'm going for the, for the triple spin. You know, so he got his courage up and he jumped on those bars with a vengeance and he went around once, he went around twice, and on his third way around as he was in the upswing, he lost his grip. And he flew in the air and flew right over the fence and landed with a thud in the cage next door. <laughs> Only to his horror to realize that he had landed in the lion's cage. And as he looked over in the corner, he saw the lion get up slowly and begin to walk towards him. And at this point, he lost his composure, and he began to scream, help, help, I'm not a gorilla, I'm a man. And he felt the breath of the lion in his neck, and then he heard a voice. And the voice said, shut up, you fool, or we'll both lose our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and it raises a very important question. Uh, the question is this, well, what makes a gorilla a gorilla? It's a very important question, especially if you're interested in studying gorillas. But a related question is, what is it that makes a Christian a Christian? Is it what's on the outside or what's on the inside? And what if these two dimensions don't match up? Now, those of you who are rather adept would say, well, if it's in the inside, it would obviously also be on the outside. If it's in the inside, it would also obviously be on the outside. But what if it's just on the outside and not in the inside? And sometimes when it comes to living the Christian life, we can feel this way. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, he says, the Spirit of God has made its home in you. God's Spirit lives in you. And that's what we're going to talk about today, God living in us through the Holy Spirit. Many years ago when I was in the seminary, my very first year, in fact, my very first theology class, we had a, a fearsome professor, or I should say a professor with a fearsome reputation, because he actually was a bit, of, a bit of a big teddy bear, but he was about six foot four, and he was a Hungarian Jesuit bishop. Uh, and his name was Attila, as in Attila the Hun. <laughs> and he was a very notorious professor, like a very uh, demanding professor. And he had this accent, like he spoke like this, you see. And he told us uh, that there are three basic mysteries to the Christian life. He said, first of all, there is the mystery of, of God. That God is... is not an impersonal God, but a personal God. In fact, a tri-personal God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the mystery of the Trinity, the mystery of God. And then he said there's the mystery of God with us, that this God became one of us. It's the incarnation, Emmanuel. 
the mystery of Jesus Christ, that, that God became one of us. And then he said, lastly, is the mystery of God in us, in us, Christ in you. That takes place through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we want to talk about today, Christ in us. We remember that at the Last Supper, Jesus actually said something very strange to his disciples when he told them he was about to leave and they were aghast and upset. He said, it's actually better for you that I leave. That seems very strange, counterintuitive. I mean, who of us would not like to kind of hang out with Jesus, to have him with us? It'd be kind of great, wouldn't it? Until you actually think about it, then you realize, you know, we probably wouldn't get near him from the crowds, you know, the security guards and uh, You'd have to be like jumping on planes all the time because Jesus with us, God with us, is limited by time and space. But God in us transcends time and space. That God can dwell in, as we hear in the scripture, make his home in us in any time and any place. This is why Jesus said, with me in you, you can do greater things than even I did. I want to begin this topic of being filled with the Holy Spirit by looking at a passage of Scripture with you. And if, please uh, join me in looking at this passage in your Bibles. It's Acts chapter 19. We hear this. It happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul made his way overland as far as Ephesus, where he found a number of disciples. When he asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They answered, no. We had never even heard there was such a thing as a Holy Spirit. He asked then, how were you baptized? They replied, with John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But he insisted that the people should believe in the one who was to come after him, namely Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and the moment Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came down on them, and they began to speak with tongues and to prophesy. We had never even heard there was such a thing as a Holy Spirit. Now, for most of us who were raised within the church, and I know there are some here today uh, who were not raised within the church, but we know that there is such a thing as a Holy Spirit. But sometimes we can be more like those people from Ephesus than we care to admit. We are, in a sense, theoretically Trinitarian. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we can be uh, practically Unitarian. We, we pray to God without distinguishing the persons of the Spirit. We're kind of like praying to uh, God the blob. I like to call that blob theology, you know, just God. Or sometimes we can be binitarians. We understand the concept of father because we have human fathers. We can relate to that image. And we get Jesus as the son because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Paul's letter to Colossians says that he is the icon of the father, or the icon of the invisible God. I think of a story of a young girl one night who was, a, who was scared because of thunder and lightning. And her mother went into her bedroom and said, it's okay, honey, you don't need to be afraid. God is with you. And she said, yeah, I know, but I need someone with skin on. <laughs> and, and that's Jesus. Jesus is God with us, God with skin on. But the Holy Spirit is a bit more difficult to relate to, a bit more difficult to understand. I mean, I, I remember the Holy Spirit before he got the name change, remember? It used to be called the Holy Ghost. And how do you relate to a ghost? I mean, I, you're, you're, I'm scared of ghosts. And uh, how do you even imagine a Holy Ghost? I knew about Casper the Friendly Ghost, <laughs> but uh, so I thought of kind of like this ghost with a sheet, the, maybe a halo ar around the head. And uh, the Bible used to talk about the paraclete. Jesus says in John's Gospel, I will send you a paraclete. A, a paraclete is, is a word that means uh, comforter or advocate. 
And I remember as a child hearing that and thinking, a paraclete? What's a paraclete? I'd heard of a parakeet. <laughs> and I knew that the Holy Spirit was sometimes imaged as a dove. So I thought, you know, a dove or a parakeet, who knows? <laughs> Casper the friendly ghost. I didn't get the Holy Spirit. And I think I'm probably not alone in that, in the fact that it was difficult for us to understand the role of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here today, so that we can know more about who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and also experience the Holy Spirit. I want to look at another passage of Scripture with you, this time in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48, if you'd like to turn there. Acts chapter 10, 44 to 48. This is a story of the first time the gospel was preached to non-Jewish believers. And in the early church, this was a big deal because they never thought that would ever happen. And Peter goes to the house of Cornelius and he preaches. He preaches the gospel to them. And it says this in verse 44 following. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all the listeners Jewish believers who had accompanied Peter were all astonished that the gift of the Holy, Holy Spirit should be poured out on the Gentiles too. The Gentiles are the, the non-Jews. Since they could hear them speaking strange languages and proclaiming the greatness of God, Peter himself then said, could anyone refuse the water of baptism to these people now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, while Peter was still speaking, in the middle of his homily, the Holy Spirit interrupted his homily. That's a very bad thing to happen. Pre preachers don't like that. But God does what he does. And he come down with, in a powerful way. The, the, the people in that room experienced the power of God's Spirit because it says that the people who came with Peter saw what happened and were amazed. They, they saw something something visible. And it also says that the people in that upper room proclaimed the greatness of God. And it says that they spoke in strange languages. So I would like to take a few moments with you to look at these three things, these three things that are often a part of the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that happened was that they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about experiencing the Holy Spirit, there's one essential principle that we need to hold on to. And that is that the experience of God's Spirit is different for everyone. There is no one kind of experience by which we can say, aha, that's the Holy Spirit, and that's not the Holy Spirit. It's different for everyone. The Holy Spirit comes to each of us in our particular needs, in our particular personalities in particular ways. For myself, I was uh, raised in a kind of a traditional Catholic home. We went to church every Sunday, but um, we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit all, all that much. And when I look back, I remember fondly the day of my first communion, the day I made my, my first communion. I remember my parents gave me a gift of a cross. And I remember being in my mother's bedroom and taking that cross and holding it to my heart. I don't know why I did that, I just did it. But I remember uh, having a sense of, of peace coming over me. It just almost like I got a hug from God. It just a, an incredible sense of God's closeness and God's presence. Never forgotten that moment. But as I grew older and went into my teenage years, I kind of became a little distant from God. I kind of went my own way. And uh, towards the end of high school, after I had you know, gotten into a little bit of trouble, uh, I was forced to go on a, a weekend, kind of, kind of like this one maybe. And uh, on that weekend, on the Saturday night, I had a powerful experience of God's Spirit. And it was so powerful, it left such an imprint upon me that I can go back to that very room and say, this is where I sat. I, I remember the experience that, that well. This is where I was sitting. And the experience was of God's unconditional love. And that is uh, uh, theologically correct because scripture says that, 
that the love of God has been poured into our hearts, that when we experience God's spirit, it is the love of God that is filling us. And that night, that's what I experienced. I experienced God's love, God's unconditional love that says, I love you, I love you, I love you as you are. You don't have to change for me to love you. And it was such a powerful experience. I had an image of of having lived my entire life in a small space, in a small room. And that night, it, it was as if the wall was broken down. And on the other side of this wall was this infinite space. And the wall was paper thin. <laughs> you could poke holes with it with your finger. That was the image. And it was the beginning, really, of the rest of my life. It was the beginning of a, of a new walk with God in, until I could grow up in my faith. And as time went on, I became very much hungry for more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to grow more. And I remember uh, being invited to go to a conference after my first year at university, and I went to this summer conference with my cousin. And uh, I wasn't sure what kind of conference this was, but they told me there's a lot of focus on the Holy Spirit. So I thought, great, I want to experience more of the Holy Spirit. And we went in on the Friday night, and there was about a thousand people at this conference. And uh, the music was really good, but it was a little weird because people were kind of putting their hands up in the air. It was a little strange. I was checking out what the exit signs were, you see, ready to, ready to make a bolt for it. But the music was good. The music was good. And, uh, and as the time went on, uh, when they, they would sing, finish these songs, I thought, I heard people talking. I thought, well, that's very, very rude. Then I realized they were talking to God. They were, they were praying out loud to God. I thought, well, that's a bit odd, but there's something beautiful about it. So I was open to that as well. And actually, as the night wore on, I actually even tried the putting up the hand thing. At first, I was really self-conscious. I was like, you know, who's looking at me? But I realized, too, that there was a certain, I was at the very back row, so no one was looking at me, and no one seemed to care what I was doing or not doing. And I experienced a kind of freedom in, in being able to use my body. In fact, as a part of it, it seemed kind of natural to express my prayer with, 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 with my body. Anyway, the next night, if I thought Friday night was weird, Saturday night got a little more weird. And Saturday night was a night where people were being prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we, I sat there, I'll never forget it, it was a hot, hot August evening. I'm there with my cousin, we're watching these things happen and it's getting a little strange. I mean, some people are actually like falling over and I'd seen this on TV, <laughs> I thought they were all a little crazy, you know. And uh, we sat there and the conversation went like this. It was like, are you gonna have to be prayed with? Well, I don't know. Are you going, I don't know. Well, I'll go if you go. Well, I'll go if you go. Well, you go first. No, you go first. <laughs> and I went back and forward like this. And I don't know how we decided, but somehow we decided that he would go first. And then the next thing was, well, who are we going to go to get prayed with? So we looked out and we found the, the least threatening looking person possible. It was this little four foot high little old lady, about 75 years old. And we said, let's go to her. So my cousin went first and he went down. And as he approached her, he literally... As he went up to her, he basically assumed the kung fu position, like this. You see the the muscles in his legs were flexed. It was like, you know, just come on, come on, give it a go. And she went, no word of lies, she went up to him and she made the sign of the cross on his forehead and he went on the ground. And I I totally lost it. I couldn't believe this. Uh, And then I went forward to be prayed with and a very similar thing happened to me. Now, I'm telling you this not because of these things that happened, but to tell you about what happened afterwards. Because what happened afterwards was, to me, a similar experience to that experience I had had in that room several years before. What happened afterwards was an incredible experience of peace, like I'd never known before in my life. And again, I had this image of of standing at the, the shore of a lake a vast lake that went, stretched as far as you could see without a single ripple on that lake. And in the days and weeks after that, people were looking at me saying, what what happened to you? You know, there was just a sense of peace. Now, I I wish I still had it. (laughs) But it was an incredible experience of peace. And see, in the end, this is how we know whether something is of the Holy Spirit or not. As a priest, I often have people come to me describing either very 
normal, banal experiences or very bizarre experiences, and they'll often say, do you think this was from God? And I always say, I don't know. I'm not willing to say yes. I'm not willing to say no. How do we know something is from God? How do we know that we've experienced the Holy Spirit? Because for some people, it's a very emotional thing. For other people, there's no emotions. For some people, there are strange things that happen, like what happened to me. For some people, it's very normal. How do we know? In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22, this is a great passage. If you can maybe underline that passage in your Bible, we hear this. That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's what Nikki talked about in the talk about the family likeness. Love and joy and peace and gentleness. So the question is not, what did I experience? But since your experience, are you more loving? Are you more joyful? Joy. You know, someone once said, you know, Lord, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila said, Lord, preserve us from unhappy saints. The Spirit of God leaves joy in our lives. Another person said, if Jesus is in your heart, please notify your face. <laughs> you know, joy. So am I more loving? Am I more joyful? Am I more gentle and compassionate and forgiving? If the answer is yes, then yeah, you probably experience the Holy Spirit. If the answer is no, it doesn't matter how remarkable your experience was, it's not of God. Because God always leaves footprints. God always, God's Spirit always produces fruit. And if you don't know the answer to your question, ask your spouse or the person you live with, the person who has to put up with you the most. They will tell you if you're more loving or more gentle or more peaceful. That is the presence of God's Spirit. And in the end, that is the most important thing because down through the ages, thousands and thousands and millions of believers have experienced God's Spirit, the saints and the mystics. And in the end, the, we know that these were true and authentic experiences because these people became more like Jesus, more loving, more peaceful, more joyful. The second part of our talk, we go back to the room in the house of Cornelius. Remember, the Holy Spirit came down in the middle of the homily. They saw the power of the Holy Spirit. They experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. It also says that the people there proclaimed the greatness of God. They praised God in a spontaneous way. They didn't take out their prayer books, the psalm books, and begin to sing the psalms or read the psalms, which they could have. But it was a spontaneous thing. They began to proclaim the greatness of God. Now, that generally is not something that we are used to doing in the church, spontaneously proclaiming God's greatness. We may spontaneously praise one another. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, something wonderful has happened or someone has done something wonderful and you, you just want to say, Suzanne, that was incredible. You did an amazing job. You're, you're so gifted. We've had those experiences where we're just overcome with the need to praise someone. We don't read the script. It just, it just comes out of us. And so it is in a relationship with God. God's spirit works within us and stirs up our spirit so that we want to praise God. Now, in many of our church cultures, we, we tend to be shy about this kind of expression. There's a story of a man who walked into uh, one of our churches and he was so overwhelmed with the Spirit of God, he said, praise the Lord. And this man went up to him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, sorry, we don't do that here. We don't praise God here. <laughs> and in general, if something like that was ever to happen, we would probably feel a little uncomfortable, wouldn't we? We'd probably get up and move to another pew. Just a little uncomfortable with that kind of enthusiasm. Do you know what the word enthusiasm actually means? It means to be in God. To be enthused is entheos. It means to be in God, to have God in us. So if God is in us, hey, he should be enthusiastic. 
Besides, think of all the other things we get enthusiastic about. Think about all the other areas of life in which we get, well, get into it. Uh, I think of sporting events, go to a hockey game, baseball game, okay, maybe not baseball game, but uh, maybe a <laughs> hockey game, we get into it. Uh, I grew up in Scotland, if you want to see people getting into sports, go to a football match, uh, soccer match, that is, and uh, you will see, I remember one of the last professional soccer matches I went to in Scotland when my team scored a goal, 60,000 men erupted in an explosion of joy and hugged and kissed each other. They never even met each other in their lives. You, you talk about emotion, it was, it was right there. And I didn't see one single person say, oh, I'm very uncomfortable about this, I think I'll leave at half time. <laughs> it doesn't happen, we just get into it. Uh, think of a movie, you go to a movie that, that moves you, or you move to tears, or you laugh out loud, or get into it, and, and we think that that's normal. A number of years ago, I, went, I was invited to go to a concert, and it was a Sarah Brightman concert. She's one of my favorite singers. And it was very interesting to watch the, the audience interact with her, because as she walked up and down the stage and sang, people were overcome. They became very enthusiastic. And people would, would actually shout out to her, Sarah. They'd wave their hand, they'd lift up their hands and wave their hands and say, Sarah, we love you, we love you. And Sarah would wave back. And I didn't see one single person stand up and say, this is terrible, I'm very uncomfortable, and get up and leave. No, because it's expected, it's okay to be enthusiastic and express uh, with emotion in so many aspects of our lives. But when it comes to faith, sometimes there's this disconnect between the head and the heart. Sometimes we're afraid of emotionalism. But you know, in, this, in, in the spectrum between emotionalism and, um, and lack, total lack of emotion, that's not our problem. Emotionalism generally is not our problem. It's the other way around. You know, we're called to not just believe in God, we're called to love God and to be in relationship with God. And every relationship involves the affect, it involves the emotion. I mean, can you imagine after a business trip going home to your wife and saying, honey, I love you with all of my brain. <laughs> no, you'd be, you wouldn't get your supper and you'd be on the couch for a week. You know, because we, we associate emotion with being in a relationship. And why not with God? And so when the Spirit of God comes, sometimes there is a release in that, a, a greater freedom to spontaneously praise God and to uh, express our praise of God with a new enthusiasm. Lastly, we hear that in the house of Cornelius, the listeners heard them praising with strange languages. Now, this experience is referred to in the tradition, in the, in the Christian tradition, as uh, the gift of tongues. And many, often, oftentimes in the church, there is a lack of understanding about what this gift is. I want to take a few moments to talk about this simply because, well, it's, it's in the New Testament. In the New Testament descriptions of how the Holy Spirit works, we hear about the gift of tongues. In fact, in both passages from the Acts of the Apostles I read from, it, it mentions this. Um, and also because some people experience it. So I want to talk a little bit about it. In the scriptures, there are three distinct expressions of what we call the gift of tongues. There's what happened on the day of Pentecost, when the listeners heard the apostles speaking, and they all heard them speaking in their own languages. There is a gift of tongues that we hear about in the writings of St. Paul where people spoke and the, the, what was spoken was, was for the entire community and it was something that had to be interpreted. And then thirdly, there is an expression of the gift of tongues that, well, as St. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you want to go to that chapter with me because... We're going to take a few minutes to look at this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It, it follows upon the most commonly known chapter of the entire New Testament. Anyone ever gone to a wedding before? Love is patient, love is kind, right? If I speak with the, 
with the tongues of angels, but have not love, then I am, a, I am nothing. And chapter 13 ends with these words, that faith, hope, and love remain, the three of them, and the greatest of them is love. And chapter 14 begins, so make love your aim, but be eager to for the spiritual gifts. These chapter markers actually were introduced to the Bible in the Middle Ages by a, a Franciscan monk in, from Oxford University. So they're not part of the original text. And sometimes he got it right. Other times he maybe didn't put them in the right spot. So chapter 13 flows quite naturally into chapter 14. So make love your aim, but be eager for the spiritual gifts. And he goes on to speak about the gift of tongues and he describes it in this way. In verse 2, those who speak in a tongue speak to God. And what do we call it when we speak to God? Prayer. Prayer. And so this is the third type of experience of the gift of tongues. It's an experience of prayer. We, we pray to God. And he goes on to say that it's an exercise, it's a gift that, that builds up the individual. He says in verse 4, those who speak in a tongue build themselves up. And he goes on to say, well, I should like you all to speak in tongues. I would much rather that you exercise other gifts that build up the community. Because the, pro the reason St. Paul wrote in chapter 14 to the Corinthians about this is because of an excessive use of this gift. And even in the writings of St. Paul, it's clear that this gift is not a sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit, nor is it a sign of, of whether someone is an authentic believer or not. It, it's a gift. It's one of the gifts. And it's a gift that helps us to pray. Now, there are some analogs in, the, in our human experience that we can draw upon to, I think, better understand this. Um, I, I think sometimes of the experience of, of a baby. I have a, a new nephew, and he's four months old. And I'm wondering if anyone here has ever spoken to a baby before. <laughs> Her. And uh, maybe when we spoke to a baby, we've said something like goo goo gaga or something like that. Yes? Yeah. Now, what the heck does that mean, right? <laughs> you know, goo goo, all these, these baby noises we make. And, and maybe the baby has looked back at us and, and kind of made those funny baby noises back to us. And the question is is that an authentic communication? Of course it is. It's actually a very beautiful communication. It's, there's almost a purity to it because it comes right from the heart. It's, it's a direct communication from the heart that is given, uh, given verbal expression. There's no grammar, there's no vocabulary, but it's a communication of love. And in some ways, that's what the gift of tongues is, as an experience of prayer to God. It's a, a cry of the heart to God, the cry of a child to the Father, a cry of joy to God. Now, I don't have, uh, I have a nephew, I don't have any children, but I do have a dog. <laughs> and uh, if you promise not to tell anyone, I'll let you in on a secret. Sometimes when I'm alone and no one else is listening, I speak to my dog. And he speaks right back to me. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say to my dog, I'll say, Ujo bujo bujo bujo, something like that. And he looks back at me and he goes, rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> No, it's a little silly, but it's the same thing. There's, there's some kind of uh, need to, to verbalize something. And, and it happens, and it's an authentic communication. And a similar thing happens, can happen in our experience with God. I have a, a quote I'd like to share with you that comes from St. Augustine where he describes a, a similar thing. He says this. This is from uh, one of his commentaries on the Psalms. You must first understand that words cannot express the things that are sung by the heart. Take the case of people singing while harvesting in the fields or in the vineyards or when any other strenuous work is in progress. Although they begin by giving expression to their happiness in sung words, yet shortly there is a change as if so happy that words can no longer express what they feel. They discard the restricting syllables. They burst out into a simple sound of joy, of jubilation. Such a cry of joy is a sound signifying that the heart is bringing to birth what it cannot utter in words. 
Now who is more worthy of such a cry of jubilation than God himself, whom all words fail to describe? If words will not serve, and yet you must not remain silent, what else can you do but cry out for joy? Your heart must rejoice beyond words, soaring into an immensity of gladness, unrestrained by syllabic bonds. Sounds to me that he's describing what I've experienced as the gift of tongues, this going beyond uh, words, in a sense, breaking the, the sound barrier so that a, a prayer can come directly from the heart. And, and why is that important? Because, well, sometimes whenever we pray, if, we're, if, if you've ever experienced this, we pray out loud with one another. As the prayer is born in our hearts, it goes up to our brains and it will go over to the the grammar department first, okay, and we'll analyze the grammar. Then it goes over to the vocabulary department, and then it goes over to the theology department, and then it goes over to the political correctness department, and then it goes over to the, uh, to make sure you've got all the, 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 the right fancy words, the, the, the jingo department, and it's gone all around our brains before it finally comes out of our mouths. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, you're, you're praying out loud, and as you're praying, you're listening and analyzing your own prayer. Have you ever done that before? So this gift of tongues enables us to pray directly from our hearts. And one sense is, I think, a, a, kind of, a kind of contemplative prayer, a prayer of the heart. Now, the question for us is, is does the New Testament approve of this? And I believe, yes, it does. It's spoken of again and again in the Acts of the Apostles. St. Paul speaks about it. He quite plainly says that we are to be eager for the spiritual gifts. He says, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than any of you. He says, I, I would like you all to pray in tongues. But remember that it's just a beginner's gift. It's not the be all and end all. It's not the sign of an authentic believer. It's not the sign of having been filled with the Holy Spirit. So why then is it important? Why then do we talk about it? Well, because it is a beginner's gift. And I think sometimes if we can allow ourselves to accept and receive and express a gift like that, it opens the door to other spiritual gifts that God wants to give us. There's a certain amount of surrendering of our ego that must take place if we're going to say, goo goo gaga <laughs> to God out loud, even when people are around. There's, there's a certain humbling of ourselves and when we open our hearts in that way, it's my experience that God is able to work more deeply in our lives. It's also helpful for us when we want to praise God and we run out of words, like St. Augustine says. I don't know if you've had that expression, say, Lord, you're wonderful, Lord, you're great, Lord, you're fantastic, Lord, you're wonderful, <laughs> you're great. You're <laughs> It's like, I run out of words. How can words express what we feel about God? Or sometimes when we don't know how to pray about a situation. I remember one time being asked to pray for as someone who was suffering deeply in the hospital, hanging on to life by a thread. And it was one of those moments you thought, well, Lord, please take him. But is that what I'm supposed to pray for? And so sometimes I don't, we don't know how to pray. And St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that when we do not know how to pray, God's Spirit comes to help our spirit so that we pray with cries, with groans, too deep for words. And so I found that as a very helpful gift to pray when I'm praying for others and I don't exactly know how to pray. This gift, like all of the gifts God wants to give us, is, is freely offered. And like any gift, it's not enough for us to receive the gift and say, thank you very much. We've got to open the gift. And I believe that God is constantly offering gifts to us. The question is, will we open those gifts? These gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are three obstacles to sometimes being able to truly receive God's gifts. I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Verses 9 to 13. 
Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone. It doesn't say, for, for those who have the strongest faith in the world. For those who have really strong faith, who ask, they will receive. It doesn't say, those who have perfect lives, who ask, will receive. It says, anyone who asks, will receive. Everyone who searches, finds. Everyone who knocks, to them the door shall be opened. And then again, Jesus uses a, a human analogy. He says, what father among you, what, you who are parents, if your son asks for a fish, you know, what do you want for supper, son? Oh, I'd like some fish and chips. Well, which of you would then take a scorpion? Give him a scorpion. Or if he asked for an egg, would, would give a snake. You know, Jesus is saying, you know, if, if, if you, you know, like compared to God, you're, you know, we're all kind of evil compared to God. And if we don't do that to our kids, why do we think God would do that to us? Why do you think God would give us something that would actually hurt us? And so sometimes one of the first obstacles to receiving God's gift is fear. We think, oh, I'm not sure if I, if I want that gift because I'm afraid of what it might mean for my life. I'm actually afraid of it. I, I actually, I'm not sure that God is, is going to give me something that's actually good for me. So, fear. Another obstacle to receiving these gifts sometimes is, is, is doubt. That, well, God could give these gifts to someone else, but wouldn't give them to me. But remember, Jesus said to everyone who asks, they will receive. Everyone who knocks, everyone who seeks, will find. And sometimes a sense of inadequacy. We all struggle with that from time to time. Well, I'm not worthy to receive those gifts. But you know, if worthiness had anything to do with this Christianity stuff, I'd be out of here. It's not. It, the point is that God loves us and wants to bestow gifts on us, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. None of us are worthy, but that doesn't matter. God wants to pour His gifts out on us. And so, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The Holy Spirit, who is the ultimate good gift. The Holy Spirit, who is God's love poured into our hearts. The Holy Spirit, who allows Jesus not just to be with us, but to be in us. The Holy Spirit who comes with so many gifts and produces the fruit of love and gentleness and joy and peace. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I constantly seek to be filled with God's Spirit. I ask God all the time, Lord, come Holy Spirit, send your Holy Spirit on me. And I need to ask all the time because I have a problem, you see. I, I leak. <laughs> so God can fill me up, and as soon as it goes up, it goes, I have these spouts coming out of me, and, and I leak. And so I need again and again. And when St. Paul says in the Scriptures, be filled with the Holy Spirit, in, in the Greek text, he actually uses a, a tense that doesn't exist in English. It's called the present continuous tense, for those of you who are interested which means it could be translated, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on being filled on an ongoing manner. And so I believe it's proper for us, for all of us who are trying to live the Christian life or looking to see if we can live the Christian life to constantly ask God to come and to fill us up, to fill us with his strength, with his presence, with his peace, with his joy, with his love and with all the gifts that he wants to give.
Would you like to ask God to come, uh, to come and fill us up today, to give us a, a refilling? Yeah? Yes. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Oh.